everyone. I'm Maggie McGrath with Forbes Breaking News. Dock workers at 36 ports across the East Coast and stretching into the Gulf have gone on strike early Tuesday morning. It is the biggest such strike in nearly 50 years, and it will have massive implications for the U.S. economy and the upcoming presidential election. Here to explain exactly what we all need to know about it is Harry Katz. He's a professor of labor relations at Cornell University. Harry, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. So let's start at the beginning. How did we get here? How is it that so many dock workers have gone on strike right now? Well, there's a uh, master collective bargaining agreement that covers the dock workers, uh, as you said, on the East Coast and in the Gulf states. Uh, and that's an agreement with all the owners and managers of those ports. And that collective bargaining agreement has just expired. The parties have been negotiating and they've reached impasse. And the union warned, as it's now done, that it was going to strike uh, as of uh, midnight last night when the contract expired. So uh, we have an expired collective bargaining agreement and an impasse over what the terms of a new collective bargaining will be. I understand that over the weekend, President Biden was briefed on the matter and talking to both parties. He has the power to get involved here. Will he and should he step in? Well, the the president can be involved in two different ways. One, very formally, he can invoke what are referred to as the national emergency dispute procedures and force a cooling off period and forced mediation and a recommendation to the parties, and then they have the right to reject that recommendation and go back on strike. Or he can be involved more informally, uh, putting pressure uh, by uh, essentially lobbying and communication with not only the union, but also the the managers and owners of the, the port. So I suspect he's going to do the latter. I don't think President Biden uh, and his vice president in particular, Kamala Harris, want to have a fight with labor at this point, the president came under sharp criticism from a number of unions when he uh, invoked somewhat similar with related procedures uh, dealing with the railroads when railroad workers struck a year and a half ago, uh, and he got criticized by unions for doing that. I, I don't think the administration wants to be put in a similar position, but at the same time, they can exert a lot of informal pressure on the parties. They can also uh, uh, try and assist and, and and provide members from the administration to be involved in mediation. The Federal Mediation Conciliation Service will likely be involved. And so in that way, the administration will be involved. But I doubt they're going to invoke uh, emergency procedures. So we have the International Longshoremen's Association that is on strike. These are the dock workers. Who are they negotiating with? They're negotiating with representatives from an association of employers, the employers who own and operate the various ports. So there's basically a union representing the dock workers negotiating with a party that represents the management of all those different uh, ports. And that's the U.S. Maritime Alliance, broadly speaking? That's correct. Now, the U.S. Maritime Alliance and the ILA were negotiating over the weekend, and right before this strike officially took effect at midnight, there were reports that the U.S. Maritime Alliance had come up in regards to wages, agreeing to up to a 50% increase. So wages are obviously a big consideration here, but, but why did negotiations stall? What else is on the table, and why aren't they meeting each other in the middle? Well, apparently, in addition to wage issues, the, the union and the workforce are upset about the consequences of further technological change uh, in the ports, um, the, the use of information systems to check in work, and in other ways, uh, technology is threatening uh, to uh, potentially replace workers, and the workers not only are seeking to put limits on the amount of new technology introduced, but they want to share of the reward that management gets from introducing new technology. There's a long history of negotiation over new technology uh, between these parties. Containerization started in the late 1950s and early 1960s, and they reached a series of agreements about that, but apparently there are related matters and they've reached an impasse over it. Now, keep in mind as well, the workers have been hearing about other unions and certain 
industries and among certain firms reaching very strong settlements. And so they have elevated expectations. They've heard about the auto workers represented by the UAW during very, very well a year ago fall. The uh, drivers represented by Teamsters at UPS did very well in their negotiations more than a year ago. Airline pilots are doing very well. Boeing workers are now out on strike pressing Boeing for a uh, substantial improvement in their uh, negotiated offers. And so workers have elevated expectations. In addition, the workers are, are saying they deserve payback. Uh, during the pandemic, there was high inflation and, and they weren't fully protected uh, for that inflation. They also had to go to work. Unlike many of us who could continue work online, they had to show up during the pandemic and uh, they want payback for that reason. And they just have a lot of power to ask for more. Uh, management's made a, you know, a solid offer, but I suspect management's going to have to improve upon its offer. We see a number of other cases where management, either before a strike starts or once a strike starts, has had to improve its offer in order to get a settlement. Management may be uh, thinking they have more leverage than they do. Maybe they think they have the kind of leverage they had 10, 15, 20 years ago when the labor market was softer when their business was softer. Management's making a lot of profit due to the increase in shipping and and the movement of goods both outside to outside the U.S. through exports, imports of lots of goods. And so this is a situation in which uh, there's a lot of money on the table to be had, strong profits. Uh, the workers want a bigger share of those profits. And management, of course, uh, wants uh, to limit that share that goes to the workforce. So I'm not surprised in this sort of case where uh, the, the workers have elevated strong expectations and there's a lot of money to be divided between the parties that they, uh, they've they reached an impasse. They're at an impasse. How long could this strike last? What you've just outlined really sounds like it could get ugly and, and go for quite a long time. Well, it's already ugly in that as soon as the, the ports are shut down, there's a, a major disruption in the economy. But, you know, keep in mind what's happening is uh, the workers themselves are losing income. You know, they get solid earnings already, and that income uh, is not uh, fully replaced by strike benefits and all. And management is losing uh, uh, profits uh, while the strike occurs. And as that goes on, uh, they're under pressure to make up for that lost uh, income. In addition, they're going to come under increasing pressure. Management will feel pressure not only from uh, the administration, but from other firms who uh, need commerce. They need to export. They need to import. The union may come under pressure from other unions not, uh, to try and solve this uh, uh, in advance of the uh, November election. So my own guess is this is going to be a strike of sort of one week to five weeks long. You never quite know, uh, but I think they're going to come under so much pressure to settle this strike, again, from a variety of, of parties that I think they will settle. But you never know. Some strikes that you think can be settled, the parties just aren't able to find an, an agreement that serves both their interests. And it might go on for a very long time with immense consequences for the economy. One week to five weeks, immense consequences for the economy. There are macro implications, as you've just outlined, and micro implications. And I actually want to start with the micro because I was reading something earlier about groceries and bananas and chocolate and the types of food that could be affected here. And obviously, I eat a lot of bananas and chocolate because that caught my attention. But let, let's start with the food. How soon will consumers see the effect on grocery store shelves or will imports from the West Coast help supplement the stoppage? Well, you're right. Some of the good, the particularly um Goods like food uh, that can't be stored, you know, the, the parties have to do something with them. The producers have to do something. And some of those goods will be diverted into West Coast ports. Some will be diverted into airline transit or into the railroads once it's in the United States and all from the West Coast and on. Uh, but, you know, a lot a lot of uh, perishable goods are fairly quickly are, are going to be threatened. And I don't know that we're going to see dire shortages in the quickly in supermarkets. But, you know, because a fair amount of, you know, groceries and produce comes from California and other places within the United States uh, and all. But, you know, uh, as the strike, if it were to go on uh, several weeks, we'll start seeing not only shortages, but price increases 
for uh, perishable goods like food. Now, there's other goods that are really critical to the economy, automobiles, machine tools, you know, electronic component parts or finished electronic goods. Um, those are also shipped into the United States and in some cases exported out from the United States through the ports. And um, it's going to be very hard to send those goods through alternative channels. They, you know, they're too bulky. They're already, you know, the ports on the West are already pretty full with their regular shipping. They don't have the capacity to absorb a lot of additional shipping. The airlines can't carry many of those heavy goods. Uh, so, you know, if the strike were to go on more than a few weeks, you'll, you'll see some shortages appearing among durable goods, you know, larger, bigger products that normally would have been imported in the U.S. through the ports, um, that, that, that'll that come come to a halt. Durable goods sh shortage. What does that mean for Amazon Prime Day? There's one coming up. And then the, I, I hate to say it, but a holiday shopping season. I am not holiday shopping, but I understand. I know people in my family are already planning and other families are planning. Will this affect the holiday season? Possibly, you know, because again, a lot of shipping uh, occurs in advance of the holiday. So it's not that it's just a question of whether the strike's going to go on up until uh, Christmas and all, but if it continues, uh, you know, on into uh, the middle of November and all, a lot of shipping is occurring then to store up, stock up in advance of the holiday sales. So it could have consequences, you know, if it were to, to last, you know, six weeks, eight weeks and all, and then obviously if it were to continue on into through December. I suspect, again, that they're going to reach agreement before that. They'll come under so much pressure, again, not only from the administration, but from um, all, all those companies that want, want to sell goods, you know. And, and you're right, there's ripple effects. It's not just the, the party who uh, produced a good that wants it, you know, imported into the U.S. But once the imports slow, that ripples through the economy. People you know, aren't aren't making income from those transactions, and that affects their their own purchases, and so it has economy wide effects that greatly exceed any direct effects from uh, limits on the goods moving in and out. So it'll have a very very large economic effect, and so the pressure is going to build. The pressure will build, and I'm wondering also, as you mentioned, durable goods and the, these bigger items. As we look in North Carolina, an area that is recovering from Hurricane Helene. That is an area that needs a lot of relief in a number of ways. Could this strike affect recovery efforts? Well, I mean, I, I think we have enough uh, food stuff, perishables, water, and other supplies from other parts of the United States that can be moved into those areas. So I don't think it's going to have you know direct effects on the relief effort. I think it'll have you know effects on you know durable goods, cars, you know other. Uh, uh, you know, washing machines or other products, TVs that we now import from other parts of the world. But, but I think in terms of immediate relief needed in the southeastern U.S., I, you know, I think there we'll find a way. I think the bigger issue is going to be just the transportation systems, getting, getting water and, and food and other perishables to the parties. I don't think it's going to uh, have big effects. The, the dock strike won't have big effects on those relief efforts. That's that's a fair assessment. And you mentioned transportation, and I just wonder, does Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg play into this situation at all? Is Does this lay at his feet? Has he failed in some way, or does he have a role to play in helping the ILA and USMX come together in negotiations, or is this entirely a Biden and Harris situation to help solve? No, no, no. I, I, you know, I, I think uh, the, the Secretary Buttigieg will, will, will be involved. It involves tra transportation. I, I don't think it's a failure on his part that the parties have reached impasse. Look, our, our system allows parties uh, to engage in collective bargaining. Uh, and then if impasses are reached, we have various mechanisms. Again, if the economic consequences were to become so draconian to the economy, uh, the administration has the alternative to invoke national emergency dispute uh, procedures uh, at all. So it could come to that. I, I just suspect that the administration will be reluctant to intervene before the election. And, and also, I think there's going to be so much pressure on the parties, they're likely to settle uh, before the economic uh, consequences get too draconian. I mean, they're going to be substantial just because of all the reasons we've been talking about. I just think uh, there's good reason uh, to anticipate 
that there'll be pressure assistance from the administration uh, to help the parties uh, me, uh, try and mediate and solve this dispute. I think those efforts are going to be meaningful and, and will involve the, the secretary. How do you think this will impact the November election? Because we have already seen Vice President Kamala Harris struggle a little bit with the union vote. We saw Teamsters not making an endorsement in the same way they have before. And there are rumblings about pollings within Teamsters about how individual members are pulling more for former President Trump than Vice President Harris. There, there's really a kind of a difference in how unions are breaking for the two political parties this year. How does a dock worker strike affect that can, that uh, group of voters and and beyond? Well, I mean, just, just keep in mind, yes, the Teamsters, as you said, have decided not to endorse a, a candidate. At the same time, many local Teamster units and, and groups within the Teamsters have endorsed uh, Vice President Harris, and other unions have remained steadfast in their support for the administration. So you don't see spillover uh, from the kind of decision that Teamsters came to. Major unions, the UAW, the SCIU, the American Federation of Teachers, uh, they've all uh, come out with strong support for Vice President Harris. And even more importantly, uh, they uh, vowed and are setting in motion steps to help bring out the vote, to bring out the vote of their membership. You know, I think that's going to matter as an issue in that I think that contributes to the reluctance uh, uh, on the part of President Biden and Vice President Harris to uh, directly intervene and call a halt to the strike. But they're going to work hard to try and bring the parties together and get this solved before the election. There's going to be enormous pressure uh, from them and from other parties to get this resolved within a couple of weeks. When you talk about that other pressure, so obviously we have the political pressure and you mentioned durable goods like cars. Will the United Auto Workers Association step in? Will Is it the GMs of the world that will say, hey, you're really messing our supply chain? Is the pressure more going to come from other corpor from corporations or from other unions? Or if consumers get mad enough, would consumer pressure move the needle there? Historically speaking, is there one group that has more power here than another? Well, I, you know, I think the businesses that rely on commerce are going to uh, put pressure on the, the Maritime Association, the management there. I think initially uh, uh, the, the Longshore Union will get support from other unions. The other unions are going to cheer them on, go for it, you know, we're, we'll be at your back. But over time, if this strike were to last and there were severe economic consequences that start affecting not only firms but workers in other industries, then you're going to see more informal pressure. Again, there, it's not that the other employers who rely on commerce or the other unions can directly intervene uh, to try and uh, stop the strike, but there can be lots of informal pressure, and I suspect that will build over time. We've talked about the effect on politics, the effect on consumers, the effect on corporations. What else are you looking at in terms of this historic strike? Well, you know, I think it'll uh, there'll be a question about how much uh, consistency, or one might even say solidarity, prevails within each side and, and, and all. And that's really, as an outsider, it's hard to know exactly, you know, what's uh, going on internally within the the management uh, uh, group. You know, I suspect some uh, management groups may be more willing to concede uh, uh, to some of the union's demands. Maybe not give them everything they want, but give them more than that's on the table. Others be maybe more oppositional. And then within the union, there may be workers, uh, once the strike goes on for a few weeks, you know, that start putting some pressure on their leadership to settle the strike, given the, you know, the pain that income loss uh, leads to for those workers. So you'd really want to be watching what happens internally within each side, as well as what's happening in their relationship. Any other predictions? Anything we haven't covered? It's such a complicated issue that really touches all aspects of the American economy. Well, I mean, I, I will just say, add that th this uh, strike has become ever more important, ever more critical as an economic factor for our economy uh, because of the expansion in commerce. Uh, many firms have become multinational. They rely on global supply chains, suppliers from all over the world to assemble their products. And so there's a massive growth 
in the amount of goods and materials that come into the U.S. and are critical to our economy, and then also substantial continuing expansion in the exports from the United States of finished goods to other countries. And that's why this uh, impasse has become ever more critical and important is because of the expansion in the amount of commerce and the role that it plays uh, in our economy. Harry Katz, Professor of Labor Relations and Collective Bargaining at Cornell University. Thank you so much for coming on and breaking this down for us. We so appreciate your time. My pleasure. Take care.